Okay. Uh, again, before we yeah have a good afternoon. Before we switch over to the next one, one more time for that poll, just as we may have some new people that joined us. So uh, again, a reminder: which re what region of the state are you from? So far, Baltimore, Washington Metro is holding strong all day. Are the results? Okay, Southern Maryland's creeping up on them in the afternoon session, but still Baltimore, Washington Metro up front. All right, next question. All right, which of the following sectors do you represent? Again, this is a state government, county, municipal, private, commercial, non-governmental, or non-profit, or private resident. Excellent, excellent. And then the last one, John, please. So for, for that organization you're representing, uh, or whomever you're representing, are you local planning board commission member, local staff, state staff, elected official, or private sector staff? Okay, that stayed pretty steady. Okay, well, uh, our two o'clock session is uh, continuity planning for county and local boards. And I would like to invite Deepa Srinivasan, uh, the president and of, the president of vision planning and consulting, uh, who will be uh, sharing this uh, session with us. There's Deepa. I know somebody's helping with the, the slides. John, I think um, share, Sarah sharing the slides. There we go. Sounds like you're muted, Deepa. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. You're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And um, thanks for conducting the poll. Uh, it gave me a good idea of who the audience is. Uh, so I will try to tailor my presentation um, as much as I can to the audience. Um, I will um, turn off the video if that's okay, and I will come back on during Q&A. So um, the topic for this afternoon is resilient county and local planning boards. Um, this presentation will discuss various steps, procedures, and technologies that planning boards and departments can take uh, to ensure that they can continue working both during and in a post-disaster environment. So we'll start off with, uh, next slide please. So we'll start off with uh, planning board's roles and responsibilities, uh, what their current role is and what their expected role is uh, for continued planning. Uh, we'll discuss integrated planning efforts and the importance of integration across plans. And uh, then we'll go on to integrated planning efforts in light of COVID. Um, so we'll um, uh, provide you with a few examples of case studies to demonstrate some of these points. Next, please. 
So planning boards um, comprising mostly of planning commission, zoning board of appeals, historic district commissions, et cetera, um, have two main functions, main, basically uh, planning and policy making, which is the legislative function of the board, um, and the uh, regulation or development review, which is the quasi judicial function of the board. Um, their, their duties can range from reviewing and drafting comprehensive plans, issuing zoning ordinances, reviewing um, subdivision plans, to making recommendations to elected officials on proposed uh, planning changes. So the planning board's position in the structure of local government uh, greatly enhances its ability to carry out this advisory function. And it's usually placed in the middle of the flow of information through the community. So the question is, um, can and will planning boards and planning departments work to integrate emergency preparedness and hazard mitigation and resiliency principles into their comprehensive planning processes? And if yes, um, to what degree is this uh, currently happening? Next, please. So why is it important for planning boards to continue operations in light of a contingency? Um, so planning boards or departments, their activity is essentially to ensure public health and safety measures while encouraging continued economic activity, um, such as assisting people in getting permits, uh, rezoning, uh, or even assisting small businesses with providing the necessary permissions. Um, community members uh, should have continued access to the planning board to voice their concerns about various matters affecting the community. So disaster that affects part of the community should not really halt or, or slow the function of planning boards. But yet we see um, they face challenges in their roles, not only during disasters, but also during quiet times. Next, please. So what are some of the challenges um, that planners or planning boards face to, towards resiliency? Um, a plethora of plans. Uh, municipalities um, often uh, swim in a number of plans. Even small communities can have four to five or six plans guiding their development and management at any given time. And these plans are typically developed by multiple stakeholders, both um, inside and outside the government, and they pursue a variety of goals. Uh, larger municipalities may have up to a dozen plans or more, and um, rarely is this a fully coordinated effort, uh, particularly with respect to resilience. Um, also, there's an absence of collaborative uh, of a collaborative process by which to understand the various policies within these different plans that are pulling in, sometimes pull in different directions. So this often results in uh, increased vulnerability of a community. Uh, in many instances, there is little understanding uh, regarding the heterogeneous spatial effects of policies across a community, uh, let alone their effects on, on hazard mitigation and resilience. So the question becomes, um, how do these communities proceed? And to start with, um, I would like to say by integrating planning efforts. The, um, uh, the table here kind of gives you an idea of, of uh, typical plans in a community, whether it's a, a town or a county or even a state, and departments that are usually responsible uh, for the, um, uh, the development and oftentimes the implementation of these plans. <clears throat> Next, please. So what is um, integrated planning? It's basically a two-way exchange of information between hazard mitigation plans, uh, state and local plans, and other community plans. Um, uh, it, it also focuses on blending the community's plans, policies, codes, and programs that guide development and the roles of people and government in implementing these capabilities. Um, integration into these processes can occur through a diverse uh, range of stakeholders, invited to, uh, uh, to a, a certain planning process or through widespread sharing of the plans and supporting data. And integration should not be limited to uh, planning processes just within the emergency management or planning function of the state. Uh, planning initiatives related to sustainability, natural resource protection, uh, watershed management, climate change, economic development, these are all areas for possible integration. Next please. So um, two ways to accomplish plan integration in the simplest of forms is through plans and through people. 
um, integrating of local planning mechanisms where natural has hazard information and mitigation principles can be integrated into local plan local plans. Uh, this requires planners to consider, uh, for example, natural hazards, identify hazard prone areas in the community, and then identify gaps, inconsistencies, and recommendations to address those hazards. Um, integration between departments encourages collaborative planning and implementation and interagency coordination. Planners must involve key com community officials with authority to, ex to execute policies and programs and also um, collaborate uh, with departments to share knowledge and build relationships for successful implementation. Next, please. So because um, emergency planning uh, occurs at all levels of government and involves the whole community, uh, plans must be integrated uh, both vertically and horizontally to enable the various entities to work together effectively during an emergency. So let's talk about vertical plan integration. Um, this type of integration aims to ensure that planning processes at the, natural, at the national, state, county, and local levels are mutually supportive of each other. Um, it involves dialogue uh, among actors at various levels of government throughout the process. Um, for example, um, a county emergency management plan not uh, doesn't necessarily involve just the county departments, but also state departments to align to align the plan with the state. So you the advantage of of these plans, for example, a state plan. Let's talk about a, a state hazard mitigation plan. Um, uh, there is opportunity for local for towns, boroughs, uh, cities, and counties to take from the state mitigation plan. Uh, and take advantage of the resources, be it some of the recommendations that could trickle down, some of the grant sources that are applicable, or even some of the data that's, uh, that's applicable at the state level. Uh, we are currently working on the uh, Maryland State Hazard Mitigation Plan, and uh, the HIRA and Risk Assessment uh, will discuss data at uh, the regional level and the county level. So. Uh, for counties to be able to pull from that data is going to be a, a really big resource. Next please. So horizontal plan integration encourages the integration of departments and agencies at a particular level, whether it is um, at the state level or the county level or even at the, uh, you know, the local level. Um, it brings together the efforts of groups that are bound together by mutual interests. Um, it coordinates operations across the jurisdiction or among partner jurisdictions. So horizontal integration fosters um, cooperation and teamwork, allowing each entity to produce plans that meet their internal needs or regulatory requirements. So for example, a county has a mitigation plan requires the coordination of multiple county governments uh, and departments such as the uh, Office of Emergency Management, Planning, Transportation, etc. And we'll talk about this a little more as we uh, demonstrate them in our case studies. Next, please. So who should be involved um, in plan integration efforts? Uh, you know, these are just some ideas at the um, state level, at the county level, and at the municipal level. Uh, basically, key players who need to come to the table um, to be able to make decisions. Next, please. So integrated planning um, during quiet times enhances, uh, plan integration enhances risk reduction through community-wide planning by developing specific recommendations uh, that must be integrated into community-wide plans. Um, hence, this leads to a weaving together of strategies to mitigate the impacts of a hazard or, or, or uh, in, in a community. Um, also, compilation of plan measures to demonstrate that policies are in harmony rather than in contradiction with one another. Um, also, by encouraging interdepartment collaboration, coordination between departments becomes a smoother process as, as well uh, for when there, there is a disaster. Next, please. So during disasters, um, integrated planning and departmental integration reduces the community's potential vulnerability. Uh, by considering various perspectives to reduce risk and leverage partnerships to, man to maximize efforts. Um, it supports effective pre- and post-disaster decision-making by collaborating 
uh, between departments. It strengthens the comprehensive planning process and the natural hazard mitigation strategy uh, by reducing redundancy and work overlaps, reducing confusion, um, and involving uh, improving coordination between departments. Um, it also helps speed up the, the return to normalcy following a hazard event by, effect, uh, by efficient uh, collaboration and decision making uh, among uh, responsible departments. And then finally, it reduces um, the chances of gaps in the provision of relief by using interdisciplinary data and idea sharing between departments. Uh, again, all pointing to uh, promoting efficiencies and reducing redundancies. Next. So talking about um, hazard mitigation, um, these are some examples. These are hazard mitigation and risk reduction objectives and examples of how uh, these can be integrated across various uh, jurisdictional plans and ordinances. So for example, uh, the future land use plan, um, you can look at incorporating growth management techniques and buffering, um, cluster development, uh, um, can offer an option of grouping buildings away from hazardous areas while not reducing the, uh, the, the overall density of, department, uh, of development. Um, in the revitalization plan, uh, structural retrofitting structures with deficiencies to ensure structural integrity, also relocating outside hazard areas um, to maintain continuance of local services. Uh, in a housing strategy, an example would be to create programs to retrofit publicly subsidized um, affordable housing um, to reduce damage after a disaster. Next, please. Um, an example in the uh, environmental resources plan is to, <clears throat> excuse me, restore and protect natural resources such as wetlands um, that buffer and help absorb the impact of floodwaters. Um, in a transportation, long-range transportation or infrastructure plan, looking at uh, analyzing the ad adequacy of existing and projected infrastructure systems to ev for evacuations. Um, in a historic preservation plan, for example, looking at uh, establishing performance standards for redevelopment of se and sensitive use of historic resources, basically um, ensuring, uh, you know, mitigating uh, for historic resources while maintaining their architectural integrity, for example. Next, please. So examples of local planning mechanisms at the local, uh, at the local level and, uh, you know, in terms of ordinances and codes. Uh, for example, the CIP can incorporate hazard mitigation through specific uh, hazard specific uh, expenditures. Uh, strengthening at-risk public facilities such as schools, police, and fire stations. Um, also, non-expenditures, non, um, uh, prohibition against uh, support of infrastructure projects that could increase the vulnerability of future development. Um, if you think about uh, extending uh, truck lines into natural hazards areas, for example. Um, the zoning ordinance, uh, again, looking at limiting uh, development of density, uh, example, in the 100 or 500 year floodplain, uh, maybe uh, restricting development in the 100 year floodplain and limiting density in the 500 year floodplain. Um, subdivision regulations, uh, you know, looking at uh, location on, uh, in hazard prone areas such as the floodplain or areas that have steep slopes or uh, in wildfire areas that are, that are at rich, risk of natural disasters. Uh, placement of roads and residential lots and public facilities within subdivisions, which can uh, increase natural hazard risk by reducing the evacuation or public safety access. Um, also looking at improve the amount of impervious surfaces and destruction of environmental features like wetlands, uh, which can generate uh, increased stormwater runoff and reduce the capacity to absorb water and thereby increasing flood risk. Um, for building codes, for example, establishing the minimum acceptable level of safety for construction and they specify design construction standards for uh, resistance to stress or predicting no, new construction. Um, they can also uh, set standards for retrofitting existing buildings to make them less vulnerable to hazards. So these are all examples of where hazard mitigation can be integrated into a number of different plans and ordinances. Next, please. 
So FEMA um, has recommended a process for resilient communities through integration, uh, which summarizes everything we've talked about up to now. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just go through these five points. Um, one is to assess the, the planning network through a resilience lens, uh, where you identify and familiarize several risks that a community faces, including background information um, on the hazard, potential impacts, vulnerable populations, and so on and so forth. And then assessing the community's capacity to mitigate this risk. Um, and then reviewing existing plans, policies, and procedures to, to identify gaps or overlaps and you know, discussing a number of these plans. The second step is to identify and inform and engage local leadership, staff, and stakeholders. I, again, identify key players in the planning process, um, including decision makers, heads of departments, um, partner agencies, um, community stakeholders, technical experts, major employers, the general public, uh, you know, who is important enough to make a decision and have a seat at the table. And inform and engage uh, local uh, leadership to understand resiliency goals and community objectives. Um, the third one is to establish an integration agenda. So with leadership and stakeholder input uh, to establish informed and practical objectives for integrating hazard mitigation actions into the existing planning framework. Um, the next one is to find opportunities to implement uh, resilient community principles, uh, use current and future projects to carry out aspects of hazard mitigation planning, uh, reevaluate potential hazards and mitigation strategies wherever new information becomes available. Um, that is, if uh, during code revisions or a plan update or an annual review or an, uh, an amendment to a zoning ordinance and so on and so forth. And then finally, um, establishing a system to measure, monitor and report efforts uh, by establishing metrics and benchmarking to determine to what degree um, efforts are in reducing uh, losses and increasing resilience. Uh, finally, focusing on community uh, communication transparency and regular reporting to decision makers. Next, please. So I'd like to uh, sort of uh, share a few of these uh, uh, plan integration principles uh, from some of our case studies. So the first one is um, Howard County, Maryland, uh, the county um, I live and work in. Uh, <clears throat> an example of uh, horizontal integration. So for the past couple of years, we've been working with the county um, in, uh, in four uh, planning processes that are sort of running concurrently for the, uh, for the most part. Um, the first one was a hazard mitigation plan, uh, which we developed to, to assess the county's uh, potential vulnerability uh, to be better prepared for uh, basically all, all disasters, all natural disasters. Um, this was sort of followed by a uh, by a, a, a flood mitigation plan which was developed to address the challenges uh, specifically with respect to uh, to urban flooding uh, in various parts of the county um, and uh, in addition to a flood mitigation plan appendix we also developed a historic and cultural resources hazard mitigation plan uh, where we looked at about uh, 40 historic and cultural properties throughout the county uh, various architectural styles, various stages of construction, um, and uh, developed a comprehensive list of mitigation actions for these properties um, that would, uh, again, reduce risk but maintain architectural in integrity. And we uh, looked at examples that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, would put a combination of uh, single-family homes, duplexes, uh, apartment style living, um, farmhouses, industrial buildings, uh, retail, office space. We, we had samples of all of those different architectural types so we could develop actions saying um, in, in a similar situation these might be the actions you would consider for, for various hazards. Um, so the point to emphasize this is one while doing this, uh, you know, performing this task in as four subtasks, uh, we worked closely with a steering committee that comprised uh, officials from various departments, uh, Office of Emergency Management, Public Works, Parks and Rec, Fire and Rescue, Planning and Zoning. Uh, we had a range of uh, departments, um, uh, 
you know, where the officials could speak to their respective capabilities, uh, thereby determining the lead agency for specific plans and mitigation action. So we had each uh, each agency become accountable for what they were going to do um, with respect to various aspects of the plan. And more importantly, having the planning department involved provided the, uh, the opportunity to use the, the, the mitigation strategies in the comprehensive planning process, uh, thereby integrating these two planning processes. So this project not only demonstrates plan integration, but also the need for departmental integration and the benefits of running um, processes simultaneously. Next, please. So then the next uh, case study uh, that, uh, that I'd like to share for a plan we recently completed, um, Lackawanna County, of course, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, state, the county seat is Scranton, and uh, Scranton is uh, sort of a big name uh, these days. But um, the, uh, the case study here, which was an interesting, um, was that the RFP was issued by the county uh, uh, planning department. Uh, usually the RFP for a hazard mitigation plan uh, comes through emergency management agencies because the funding um, is through the state emergency management agency, which is in turn from FEMA. So it usually comes from EM, but in this case, the RFP uh, was put out by the, uh, by the planning department. Uh, so most of the communication was spearheaded by them. Uh, and, but the planning department and the EMA worked closely together, uh, which resulted in integration of a number of different principles into both the comprehensive planning process, as well as the uh, hazard mitigation planning process. And uh, this ended up uh, establishing a strong backbone for the plan. Uh, to come to fruition. And I think uh, this was a, a success story in that it would have uh, uh, not worked as well if both departments were working in silos. So this, uh, through this planning process, the uh, planning, we felt the planning department was better equipped for future planning processes to integrate risk reduction techniques into other county plans. And the, uh, the importance here is to involve and integrate the planning department in uh, in emergency management plans because planners by, uh, by profession and by their uh, expertise, they're long range, uh, long term thinkers versus emergency management folks who are uh, trained to, uh, to conduct business on a day to day basis. So any of these long range plans, uh, it is imperative to get planners involved at the, from the get go. Next please. So the third uh, case study is Miami-Dade County, uh, which is an example of both vertical and horizontal integration. Um, so a hazards and climate lens was put on existing issues, uh, which was um, you know, water availability, stormwater management, um, and infrastructure maintenance. Uh, and this meant identifying how hazards and climate change could intensify these issues. So officials worked with the Office of Sustainability to set goals for the whole county. And they began to work on a sustainability plan, which was called uh, Green Print, our design in a sustainable future. And this focused on preparing the county for future climate change, change impact through various um, county plans. So the land use plan, the infrastructure plan, the pub, and the public safety plan. So the Office of Sustainability worked closely with uh, NOAA's Coastal Services Center. And these two offices in turn worked with the county's uh, emergency resources management uh, agency, Office of Emergency Management, and the Water and Sewer Department, and the GIS division to customer to come together to form this uh, workshop, which was called uh, Roadmap to Adapting to Coastal Risk. Um, and, and in this, the workshop participants were able to uh, holistically study and discuss hazards uh, that had uh, the potential to impact their communities. Um, so the, the county-wide assessment of risk and vulnerability was also conducted, and this included uh, input from county and municipal decision makers. So this one was an example where uh, you know, all of the different county de departments worked, uh, worked together, uh, but they also worked closely with NOAA and the state um, you know, to, uh, to sort of obtain and exchange information. Next, please. So transitioning on to uh, where we are today um, on integrated planning efforts in light of uh, COVID-19. Um, some questions um, 
to, to sort of ponder is how have planning boards and departments continued operations during this time? Uh, what has and has not worked so far? And uh, where do we go from here in a, uh, a post-COVID situation? Next, please. So some strategies that have been adopted uh, for continued operations, um, basically uh, planning departments and boards, uh, both larger departments and smaller ones have had to manage continuity of operations uh, through the COVID pandemic, uh, through uh, sort of coming up with a number of strategies, some planned, some impromptu, to be able to continue their operations. Uh, for example, working with limited staff and a clear delegation of tasks among the, uh, the available staff members. Um, working remotely if uh, the offices were not accessible, um, going online and having online communication systems in place, um, Zoom, Teams, Google Spreadsheets, uh, even, even conference calls. Um, communicating with constituents at the community with uh, sharing the uh, uh, information on social media, emailing newsletters, uh, community info, sharing information on uh, the organization website. Um, also, in some cases, door-to-door -door services, sharing information through flyers, especially to reach people who didn't have the means to access technology. Um, and then broadcasting information through the local public access television. Also, um, ensuring the organization of uh, departmental activities. Uh, effectively and transparently um, delegating roles and responsibilities where they could. Uh, again, sharing information on uh, about organized materials such as meeting schedules, public information, etc. On you, on Google Docs, email. Um, just you know, being being ready and being prepared uh, with training modules and and tutorials for common plan. You know, for planning commission procedures and activities. Um, also ensuring frequent communication with the public uh, to provide them with the latest information and best ways to contact the office to establish transparency on who was available, what was going on, where. Uh, also allowing community members to voice concerns. Um, in terms of collaborating with other departments, uh, they, uh, you know, they got to work to ensure that new procedure co procedures comply with the law. Uh, collaborating with the Office of General Counsel, for example, uh, also collaborating um, a lot with the IT departments to for, for technology services to be able to get everybody up and running, uh, whether they were in the office or in most cases working from home. Um, so there, therefore, to ensure the smooth operation of department activities, um, you know, uh, needless to emphasize that collaboration is key. Next, please. So COVID-19 has pro uh, proven to be a, a tremendous challenge for cities and municipalities of all sizes. Um, you know, looking back eight months for like, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and these are some of the major challenges. Uh, this is an example, um, a case study from a, a large mid-Atlantic city um, that uh, we're working with um, that uh, uh, the challenges it faced in light of the disaster of the scale. So initially, they were underprepared to deal with the with an incident of the scale. There was a lack of clarity of the overall landscape on the COVID, of the COVID response. Um, everybody was coming to, to terms with COVID in the beginning at the same time, right from what is COVID and what do we do and where do we go? Um, hasty decision making without considering possible uh, long-term future consequences. Again, sometimes working in silos, making decisions that might impact uh, either the community down the line or impact other departments. Um, so as response to COVID-19 ramped up, there were gaps in communication. Uh, there was confusion regarding roles and responsibilities, delegation of authority, et cetera. And this could have been the result of departments not being able to function at their highest capacity given the setbacks of the pandemic, or just not having plans in place to address uh, an epic, uh, a pandemic of this nature. Um, there was also a lack of transparency in decision making within departments, and this led to a situation where um, staff was rushed to implement decisions um, just without uh, without enough clarity. 
Um, there was also a lack of streamlined interagency communication, and this led to conflicting the decision making and work overlaps by different agencies. So perhaps here is where planning, uh, the planning department could play a role in bringing multiple agencies and departments together where so there is a better integration of uh, and a better work product. Next slide. So in terms of integrated planning efforts, uh, going forward, the COVID-19 pandemic is just one example that has brought to light the need for uh, vertical and horizontal plan integration. So planning boards uh, should uh, revisit community plans, discuss and um, understand what should be done differently, understand and assess the, the municipality's needs. This is, um, this is imperative um, to estimate current capabilities and budgets and get support from higher authorities, especially if you're looking for state or federal support. Um, and then uh, ensure that planners are involved in various decision-making processes, uh, like with health public health authorities, transportation authorities, and, and, and other departments. Next. So what steps can a municipality uh, take to assess the impact of a hazard event for future preparedness? Um, so what we've done here on this slide is just prepared an outline of, a, of an impact study and an action plan, for example, in this case, a COVID impact study. Um, so the various steps would be, um, you know, uh, start with a baseline condition assessment, which is uh, assessing the statistics and project projections of future hazard events, identifying at-risk demographics. Uh, followed by preparedness, looking at reviewing the level of preparedness prior to a hazard event and then going forward. Uh, from a response standpoint, evaluating immediate and long-term response uh, and, in, and individual departmental response. In terms of recovery, um, uh, documenting the recovery process through various departments. Um, for reopening, preparing a strategy to safely continue municipal functions by considering various criteria and trends in, with respect to various phases of reopening. Also documenting lessons learned, um, listing areas of improvement and strategies that worked well, looking at uh, best practices, looking at what didn't work, looking at developing after action reports. And then finally, a list of recommendations, developing an after, after an action plan to be better prepared in the, in the face of another, ha another hazard event, whether it's one that's similar to this or a different hazard, getting your, your processes in place, getting the organizational structure in place to be able to collectively uh, work towards um, uh, dealing with, uh, with another hazard. Next, please. So here are some areas where the planning board and planning departments can play a role. Um, this might be a little hard to read, but um, if you look at the actions on the, on the left um, and then the, the very the rightmost column um, talks about involving the planning department. So for example, in a baseline conditions assessment, you would uh, look uh, have planners analyze demographics, look at impacted industries, look at address populations. Um, in the preparedness phase, planners could be raising public awareness and readiness by engaging trusted community spokespersons to deliver public health messages. In response, um, they could look at um, incorporating uh, community, community partner and stakeholder feedback to continuously improve um, emergency operations plans. Um, in terms of recovery, look to expediting certain planning department functions like issuing permits, et cetera, to help the municipality's local economy and gender functioning recover faster. All right, next please. So in terms of getting uh, integrated planning efforts and getting plans to talk, oftentimes there is a large number of plans as we have talked about. Uh, some could be lengthy department, uh, lengthy documents. Um, this could uh, require extensive review time by staff. Um, oftentimes, there is inadequate staff resources to be able to conduct this integration effort. Uh, people who are conducting it may lack consistency on reviews, no, may not know what to look for. Um, so the reviews may be prone to omission uh, and errors. 
um, also with people who are who can help integrate plans across the community. Um, there's a risk of attrition. Uh, people might leave, and so uh, new people would need to be trained on on something like this. Uh, budget constraints may or may not allow for consultants to do integrated planning. Um, and then also varying plan cycle updates. Some, some plans are on a five-year cycle. Some need to be updated every two years, some every 10 years. So, uh, you know, how do you constantly keep, keep this um, sort of current with, with respect to plan integration as a challenge? Next, please. So an idea that we toyed with is um, looking at integration um, using artificial intelligence and machine learning um, to see how this whole process of plan integration can be, uh, uh, can be automated. So we look to um, uh, sort of build a brain, look at um, you know, an ontology of defining specific terms and classifying the way you want what you want, looking at key concepts, uh, assumptions, goals, metrics, and tying them together through reasoning, and then defining these topics and subtopics, uh, looking whether it's, let's say, for example, if it's hurricane-proof shutters or flood-proofing, looking at uses, the types, the costs, the functionality, the location, success stories, everything that's related to a particular topic, sort of grouping them together, and then developing an inbuilt knowledge database um, which will use uh, different parts of speech and extract information from a natural language processing, which is the NLP, um, and index this information and match them up. So if you're looking for, um, you know, if if you're looking for something, then X, and if it satisfies one condition, then Y, um, and 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 rules and facts, and so saying, if your property is in the floodplain, then this. If your property is outside the floodplain and prone to high winds, then this. So looking to automate all of the information that we pull together so uh, the database can be easily uh, classifiable and searchable for relevant information in the community on any given topic per, per se, um, large or small. And so again, this is an idea, it's gonna take a while to, to develop this, but, um, but something that uh, that is going to be viable in the future because uh, you know, there's going to be more documents, there's going to be more ordinances, there's going to be more rules, more regulations. So sort of pulling it all into one kind of area where uh, you can look through this and get the information you want uh, in a matter of minutes rather than hours or days. Next, please. So the benefits of, of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, using artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning is that it captures and it retains the knowledge. Um, obviously, it saves a lot of review time and it reduces errors. Um, it also removes subjectivity and maintains consistency. It's not dependent on who is actually looking to integrate what parts of a document. It's not person dependent. Uh, so it ensures consistency and reviews. Uh, obviously, budget independent once you have the system in place. Um, and then it works with plans on varying update cycles as long as the information you put in is current. Um, so it allows for periodic and uh, regular gap analyses between plans. So to see exactly how uh, and where uh, this can be improved and, and where the contradictions are. And then, of course, it en uh, enables validation and periodic testing, all much sooner than. Uh, you know, a, a human mind would do. Um, so granted that this will not be perfect, it will have its glitches, but it'll come close to it. Next, please. So just, um, you know, uh, in, in conclusion, with integrated planning efforts, um, plans will indeed talk, people will indeed collaborate, hazards will be mitigated, and lives will be saved. Um, I like to end with this uh, Three Little Pigs cartoon um, a lot of the time, and I, my word is uh, integrate, integrate, integrate. Next, please. So just leaving you with a, with a few questions here. Um, what does your community do well in terms of integrated planning, and where can these efforts be improved? Um, how would integrated planning efforts have helped your community respond to COVID-19? Um, also, what are short and long-term actions that your community might take um, to adopt or improve these integrated planning efforts? 
All right, and I think uh, with that, uh, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Deepa. Um, either questions or if anybody has any feedback on that last slide, those are some, those are good questions to ask yourselves internally. I do have a couple on here. Um, one is, uh, but we'll, we'll take more, one seeking some uh, clarity. It said the presentation says that planning boards issue zoning ordinance, uh, but isn't that a legislative function that can only be done by the legislative body, not an administrative body? Yes, that is correct. It's probably just seeking clarity. And this one, I think, um, uh, especially in, in your role and you're working on the statewide hazard mitigation plan, uh, I think that uh, you might have some insight here. So. Um, this one is concerned, this question is concerned that uh, emergency management in Maryland is, is often multifaceted and confusing and not together. Uh, how do you think, I guess my question, I, I'll follow up with how do you think that maybe the hazard mitigation plan or other plans uh, might help with this? So uh, if you could clarify the question, I want to make sure I understand it completely before I answer. Sure. The concern is that emergency management in Maryland is multifaceted uh, and confusing. Um, so I added on the next question because I know you're working on the hazard mitigation plan and maybe you have some insight on that and what you're working on or, or how to respond to that. So I think for every planning uh, process, uh, the the success of the plan is, is sort of dependent on the inclusiveness. And our approach to the Maryland Hazard Mitigation Plan update is to be uh, completely inclusive with whether it's academic institutions, non-governmental agencies, or um, state departments. Every single department in the state of Maryland has been invited to be included in, in, as part of the planning process. And then also all of the um, the counties, um, as well as uh, the cities of uh, Baltimore, Annapolis, and Ocean City have been included and invited specifically. So we are um, uh, we've developed a comprehensive outreach process to reach out to these folks uh, via email, via surveys, via meetings, via calls. Uh, to obtain the information that is necessary because while this is coming out, it's funded by by the state, by FEMA, it's coming out through, uh, through MEMA, a lot of the um, actions are going to require uh, other state agencies to take the lead. So it is imperative to invite them and include them from the get-go of the planning process. So yes, while uh, MEMA is uh, is a complex agency, we are working closely with other agencies uh, within the state uh, to develop a product that's going to be um, truly usable by all, uh, even uh, even for the other state agencies. Thank you. I have another question here. How can locals use the data developed as part of statewide efforts, such as the hazard mitigation plan or others, for their in their long-range planning processes? So um, it, it's the the HIRA is not complete, so it's a little premature of me to talk about talk to the HIRA. But typically, um, in state hazard mitigation plans, data is sort of parsed at the regional level. Um, and the county level. So in this case, if we talk about regional regional data, we might be looking at the western region, eastern, northern counties, and then southern Maryland, and then the central uh, Baltimore area region. So it's in five regions. So uh, data is sort of, uh, you know, parsed in those categories. And oftentimes, again, I'm not talking to this particular plan, but in general with state plans, uh, data is included at the state level, whether it's uh, the number of flood insurance policies or NFIB data or uh, community rating system communities um, or population data. It is parsed by county. So uh, risk data sometimes uh, is, is parsed by county as well. And oftentimes counties that don't have the, the resources um, financially or technically to develop a HIRA, let's say, uh, for their county level plans can pull information and reflect the state plan 
uh, and the information for their particular counties. We've done that in the past before and it's worked very well uh, because some counties just did not have the budget to conduct a, a full-blown hazard and risk analysis and we were able to pull from, from a state plan. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. Uh, will the will the, that plan, I think the hazard, the statewide hazard, hazard mitigation plan, either address or include the new nuisance plan requirements, nuisance flooding plan requirements? Yes, I believe it will. Uh, again, I don't know that for sure, but I, I, if I recall, there were some initial discussions in the past, and we will be looking at uh, some of the more salient um, plans within the state. So, nuisance, um, the nuisance flooding plan will be included. Um, I'm going to ask a question just for myself as a working for Maryland Department Planning. Um, in, in June, the uh, House Bill 1045 from 2019 went to, or passed in 2019, went to in fact requiring comprehensive plans, plan for uh, affordable and workforce housing. You mentioned earlier um, briefly affordable housing strategy for uh, subsidized units. I'd be interested in um, an example of a mitigation strategy or long-range planning strategy and a comprehensive plan related to the development of affordable housing, especially when we were, we were talking earlier this morning uh, in the climate adaptation framework discussion about, you know, equity, environmental justice, and the impact of the disproportionate impact of these um, of these events and, uh, you know, changing climate on the most vulnerable population. So, I guess it's a long question, but I'm thinking of thinking of it both from you know the new affordable housing planning requirements uh, in relation to this. Do you have any example strategies or thoughts? I'm, I'm afraid I'm I'm not an expert in in that area, so you probably will know more than me, and I I don't mm -hmm. want to uh, sort of put my foot in my mouth, if you will. Uh, but that's that's an area that I think is going to be. I, I will be honest of. Of all of the different plans and ordinances and, and integration efforts, not a whole lot of emphasis has been given to the housing side. I, I don't know why. Um, and I think this will this is the time to sort of start looking at affordable housing issues and mitigation strategies for the same. And um, it, it's kind of to me personally, it's uh, uh, I haven't done a whole lot of work on it, but. I, I know that there is going to be more emphasis, um, such as uh, sustainability and climate change uh, in, in the face of resilience. Okay. Um, how can citizen planners be involved in the retrofitting of existing, existing buildings and infrastructure that are currently lo located in hazard areas? Should, should, is the question, should planners be involved? And it's specific to citizen planners, how can citizen planners or a planning board um, be involved in the retrofitting or the work going into retrofitting uh, of existing buildings and infrastructure that are currently located in hazard areas? Um, I would think from uh, from a permit standpoint, I, I think um, you know looking at these. Uh, 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 buildings very closely to make sure that they are actually one um, adhering to standards and two are probably even exceeding standards so i think from an, uh, a permit issuance um, uh, kind of area um, uh, I, I think is where uh, you know planners and planning commissioners can can be uh, uh, you know can can sort of uh, um, make those decisions. With respect to citizen planners, I think um, a lot of it is outreach and education, um, you know, providing the materials that are necessary for them and providing materials that are uh, updated and easily available, whether it's on the on the website or, or what have you, on what citizens can do, um, citizens and citizen planners can do um, to retrofit um, even some of their own properties. If you look to, um, let's, uh, if you take the example of, say, floodproofing, a lot of it is uh, individual property owners retrofitting their own properties. So it goes back to being educated on what's available. Um, I think citizen planners can come into play with respect of cost, uh, co cost, funding sources, where 
uh, where uh, the contractors are available, the types of materials, and there are communities that are doing that, uh, that provide all of this information to the public in a very uh, easy to uh, uh, easy to understand manner and, and a useful manner. So I feel that's where citizens plan citizen planners can be uh, can be involved. Okay. Uh, we have one follow up statement on the housing question. Every plan has a statement on workforce housing, but in my experience, no one really wants it. NIMBY. So you know that's another concern. Yeah. You, you know, you know this and this this might be a, a tough enough. Uh, conversation just on the hazard mitigation side, but when you add in the other uh, components to it, yeah, it can make it even yeah. more tricky. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I have another question here. Do you have any suggestions on how local planners can get the concepts of, and this one's long, I'm gonna have to repeat it a couple of times, uh, how local planners can get the concepts of integrated planning for hazard mitigation understood and accepted by the general public? Usually professional planners and government agencies understand the need to have integrated planning, but the public has a hard time understanding and appreciating the complexity of these long-term planning projects, especially when not, when not faced with an immediate crisis. Good question. Um, I'm gonna just make sure I answer this the way it was asked. Um, I think it goes back to education and I wanna, I want to kind of um, pull, uh, uh, talk about an example that of integrated planning that we did a, I don't know, two or three years ago in one of the communities in um, in uh, in Maryland, one of the counties, um, where we actually had a, a, a full room of uh, of folks, planners, non-planners, um, government officials, um, citizens, um, town administrators. And we actually walked them through the process of integrated planning. Um, and it is it was demonstrating what was in the hazard mitigation plan and how that impacts what's in the comprehensive plan or in a, in a water resources plan or what have you. And we actually went through uh, an exercise where we identified language and demonstrated it in the, in the two plans and then came up with recommendations to include in the comprehensive plan and and i think it was like a town plan if i remember correctly um and and that through that exercise it sort of i think educated the public on what we were looking for what was important um, we tweaked the goals we developed new objectives and we made uh, very specific recommendations in these plans uh, that reflected safety, that reflected resiliency. So I think it's, um, I, I don't know the short answer to this, but it's really taking the, the, the community through that process to make them understand uh, why it's important to have actions that are in harmony with one another and not contradict. You know, you, you can't have, um, you know, your waterfront might be uh, an amazing tourist spot and and you know great for economic development but if it's in the 100 year floodplain what are the ramifications so making those connections and coming up with uh with uh, you know simple examples i think will will help educate uh, educate the community i'm sorry my answer was long winded i was just trying to trying to recollect a, a, an exercise that we performed that was successful no, oh, well, th thank you, Deepa. I mean, it's a complicated question, and I mean, probably there's many, many more things that could be said about it. Well, it looks like we're out of questions, so I want to thank you very much, Deepa, for joining us. Uh, NPCA thanks you, um, and you're kind of, in many respects, you blended a lot, a couple of the presentations uh, we had earlier today, talking about you know the, the workings of the boards and and one we're going to have next as well, but also. Uh, in relation to uh, the climate adaptation framework when we had in the morning in relation to hazard mitigation. Yes. So a lot of this, a lot of this, we, we already knew this, but a lot of this is, is well uh, integrated. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanna thank everybody else who's still on. It's been a hectic one after the other day. We have one left um, and I will stay in touch deep. I know we'll be, I'll be seeing you in regards to the statewide hazard mitigation planning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a safe You're welcome. Thanks.